Kathy has written books she has written. You'll see at the back there. She's written Leap into Literacy, Teaching Fairly in an Unfair World. Great title. We work together on creating caring classrooms, about building compassion and caring in the classroom. And we are like-minded. I teach uh, drama. We're taught drama at Oise UT and literacy and Kathy at York University and we've been friends and colleagues and taught side by side for many years. But today we're here to celebrate her newest publication, really, really hot off the press, with another brilliant title, Kathy, Yee You, Conquering the Crowded Curriculum. So today we're going to look at that crowded curriculum and Kathy's going to give us insights about conquering it. Welcome Kathy, good Lundy. Well, thank you. I, is my mic on? Yes? Okay, good. Uh, thanks, Larry. Larry's a great okay. friend and a beloved person. I know everybody loves Larry. <laughs> People come up to me all the time and say, do you know Larry Swartz? I go, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't you love him? Yeah. <laughs> Move <Sort> on. <laughs> no, I do love him. Um, and I, 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 I have to go and teach, so I'm, I only have 20 minutes and then I'm going to be zipping out the door. And My late husband used to say, teachers show up. So I kind of have to. So if I appear to be like zipping out, it's not that I don't want to hear about all the other amazing books that are, are uh, part of the Pembroke Library, but I have to be at York at 10.30 to do what I have to do. Um, I can't actually quite believe that I'm standing up here <laughs> because I think some of you have seen me talk about this book when it was never published. So I'm pretty proud of the fact that I finally uh, conquered the crowded curriculum myself. And when, I, when Mary sent me the notice that it was, <laughs> I was so happy. I just sort of, you know, <laughs> fell apart. Which kind of reminds me of Billie Holiday who said, you know, the difficult I'll do right now, the impossible will take a while. And I kind of felt that it was. You know, this is, and you can read about why I was so blocked uh, in the preface of the book, but uh, I'm pretty happy that, uh, I managed to do this, and I couldn't have done it without Mary, um, or without my uh, with uh, my editor Kate Revington, who used to meet me in Tim Hortons in Aurora and hold my hand and <laughs> tell me it was all going to be okay. <laughs> you know, and you kind of have to keep these people in mind. You know, there's this great. I, I'm on Twitter, and I I love some of the uh, images that come come up, and there's this great. Uh, project where people take pictures of kids on their very first day of school and there's a whole bunch of them you can you know download a whole bunch of them and they're from all over the world but there's something about this little guy look he has no idea the poor child of what awaits him <laughs> and uh, you know I've been in teaching now for 40 years I started teaching at Malvern Collegiate in 1975 and it's 2015 I cannot believe it's been 40 years but I always remember my I'm from Montreal so I didn't even know what the the TTC was, you know. I sort of vaguely, I think, knew there was a subway. But um, I remember the, my mentor teacher, who they appointed on my first day of teaching, took me into the grade nine classroom. I was so hysterical. I had no idea what I was doing, and I was a wreck already. And uh, she was helping me hand out TTC stuff. I don't even remember <laughs> it. Except that I was, uh, I was so, sh I was shaking so much that this kid named Stuart Lash said, Relax, miss, you're not going to last very long if you're this nervous. <laughs> so to Stuart Lush, you know, who probably is like 60 now, I, <laughs> you know, who knows. But I remember him just way at the back, blonde hair, grade 9 kid. So I've kind of relaxed a bit. And um, in this uh, book that I'm, I'm working on, I've, I've sort of come up with some frames for how do you conquer this curriculum. You know, how do you, I'm, I had dinner last night with a, a wonderful teacher, one of my most brilliant students who teaches in the Toronto District School Board now, grade eight. She was telling me that she teaches every subject except French. With, she's with her kids all day long, all the time doing all that she needs to do. Now, I can't think of anybody who could do it better than Amy Sathwaite, but you know, it's pretty, pretty exhausting. And so I've sort of come up with a couple of frames. And I'm going to talk about these very quickly, and I'm only going to actually talk about uh, reciprocity and reflection. But 
in the book, I've kind of framed the work around these, these six R's, that there's, you know, it's important to have reciprocal relationships with, not only with your kids and with your peers in classrooms, but with the work. You know, to have a reciprocity, to have a dynamic kind of conversation with the kind of teaching, teaching you want to do. And, you know, relationships we know are important, respect for, um, for the work as well as uh, the, the people in, the, in, the, in your lives, in your teaching lives. Um, I talk a lot about risk because I'm involved in this great big research project uh, called All Eyes, on in All Eyes on Education, which is happening in 10 different school boards in Ontario, where we're looking at innovative teaching in math, science, and the arts with the support of technology. And I'm working with 30 teachers who there isn't one weak link in any of these schools. And they are, they talk about the risks that they have to take, that they have to just sort of go in there and try it. And you know, the kind of courage that that takes to uh, do that kind of work when you know you have to be accountable. Uh, to all sorts of different people, including parents and your administrators and the ministry. It's pretty remarkable. So it takes a fair bit of resilience. And I talk about that as well. Um, so the All Eyes on Education uh, project uh, began after I began this book, because my Eyes on Education, which are the, are the five <coughs> chapters of this book, include this. You know, having a sense of inclusiveness, making sure that every voice in that room is heard, making sure that the silent voices are, are listened for. Uh, that whole equity agenda that we all know about and care about and work towards, caring about who's heard and who isn't, who's noticed and who isn't. And it's really interesting, um, one of my, uh, one of the, my colleagues in this um, project, um, one of the teachers in uh, uh, Windsor Essex Catholic District School Board, Beth Renault, uh, talked about how her identity as a teacher and her ideas about inclusiveness were shaped by the ways in which she had been taught. So, you know. One of the things that we're looking at in this, in this research project is how we are shaped by our shapings. You know, how, how do we teach is because of where we've been. Um, what we look out for are, are because of the way in which we've been treated. And she had a difficult time in school. And she told the story about how when she was in grade four, she went with her mother to a teacher parent interview. And the teacher didn't remember who she was. And she started to cry as she told this story. And one of the things we're going to get these teachers to do now that their the strike action is no longer happening is that they're going to come and, and perform their stories of innovation at York University on February 17th. They're going to come and tell us about what shaped them, what allowed them to become the innovators that, that they are. And this is her monologue about how she looks after her kids, includes them because of the, she knows what it feels like to not be. I see them in my class trying to fly under the radar, too shy, too awkward, too unsure, too scared. The ones whose heads are filled with so many other worries that I have to say, that what I have to say about my lessons really doesn't hold a candle to the things that occupy their thoughts. I see them in my classroom trying to avoid making eye contact. They aren't looking for great acts of kindness. They just want, no, they need to be acknowledged, that they are there, present. I know that they are yearning to find their place in my class, and it's my goal to acknowledge that yearning, to make sure that they feel wanted, appreciated, and accepted here, not just once in a while, but every single day. It's what drives me to be the teacher that I am, helping my students to find their own joy of learning, their own particular unique voices. So inclusivity is part of all this. Uh, understanding that uh, we are here to serve kids. We are in the service of our students. 
all of them. One of the things that uh, last night when I was talking to Amy was the, the inclusion of Roma students in this particular school that she's in and her desire to find ways of looking after these students that have had such a difficult time historically. So inclusive and, uh, inclusiveness is important. Um, understanding uh, who's in the room. How do you find out about the identities of your students? How do you acknowledge them and look after them and work towards including that, that kind of understanding about self into the work around curriculum? So that's another frame, another chapter in my book. How do you get kids to ask really good questions? So the inquiry piece, uh, you know, how do you make sure, my husband used to say to me, you never ask kids a question that you know the answer to, ever, ever. I, he was a nice guy, but you know, he was pretty <laughs> strong. <laughs> and um, you know, I think that that's driven uh, my writing of this particular chapter. And one of the really interesting things about this project that I'm working in is in the planning of the inquiry projects in the 10 different schools, we only could get so far. You know, we could only go so far because really, if you really believe about collaborative inquiry and co-constructed learning, you have to give it over. And for the students to ask the questions that they care about. So that, that chapter was a challenge for me uh, to write about what I care about and to give teachers uh, permission to allow those questions, to live in the questions with your students, to kind of muck around with them um, as, you, as you move towards answers. You know, I think one of the things that um, I know about teaching and is what is so challenging about it is that you, you, you don't know or you shouldn't know uh, very much. And in the last chapter, which is on integration, look at how I spell integration. I love it, integratio. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the fourth chapter, but the, the last chapter is on innovation. And what I know is that um, You've arrived when you don't know. When you have enough confidence as a teacher to go in and say, let's find out together. And um, Wendell Berry's poem, uh, Our Real Work, kind of sums this up. It may be then when, that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And when we no longer know which way to go, we have begun our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. So one of the things I write about in this book is the challenges that we face with all that is uh, uh, in, in front of us, how we are impeded by a lot of what is asked of us. But actually, it is that constraint that forces us if we're willing to go into new realms of teaching, to try new things out that we've never, we've never done before, to have that kind of faith in not only yourself but in your students and in the work you can, so that you can move forward. Um, I, I write in my last chapter about my six R's and um, I'm just going to finish with two images that I include. One of them is a glass of water. And when I talk about reciprocity, uh, I think about this image and this story of, uh, I'm from Montreal, as I told you, and had the opportunity to go a couple of years ago to do a workshop <coughs> there at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, where I used to go with my mother as a little girl. And there I was, sitting in this beautiful museum that was part of my childhood, part of my identity, part of my culture, and listening to this wonderful man, Michael Smith, playing the piano, and he, he gave this fantastic keynote. But he told this fantastic story, <coughs> which really affected me. He talked about how he, he goes all over the world, and he does all sorts of amazing music 
arts education workshops, and he speaks, but he always starts by playing the piano. And he was in a prison, and he was sitting in the auditorium in the prison playing the piano, and the inmates were coming in and sitting down, and he uh, continued to play, and this great big guy comes and sits down in the front row, and then gets up and walks out. And he says to himself, well, you can't win them all. And then about five minutes later, the man comes back in, same guy, and he puts a glass of water down on the piano and says, thought you might need that. And I love that story because it tells me a number of things. As I, and I say this to my student teachers, you never judge. You have to be really careful not to judge too early. You check yourself. Because we tend to do that. He judged that guy before he had an, uh, an opportunity to find out who he was. But there's also that reciprocal thing that happens in classrooms, that kind of dance that we play with uh, each other as we get to know each other. And I, 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 I think that this is an extremely important part of conquering the crowded curriculum, to kind of do it together in a way that is, is respectful and understanding and exciting. And my final uh, image is, is this one, which is centered around the idea of reflecting on our work. And uh, a number of years ago, I was invited to go and speak at the um, Saskatchewan Reading Association. And what I loved about how they set up the conference was that they had the speakers sit at tables with teachers the night before. So no panel. You know, sorry. <laughs> and, um, you know, and no, no uh, chart paper. You know, let, and with, with this, you know, would somebody come and just talk about what you've been talking about? You know, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, we just sat and uh, I sat at a table with a first year teacher and a teacher who had taught for a long, long time. And it became apparent very early on in the conversation that we were sitting at, in the midst of a, a brilliant teacher. And she talked about teaching in a First Nations community in northern Saskatchewan. And she talked about the kinds of things she did and the kinds of ideas she invented and the kinds of collaborative community events that she promoted in her classroom <coughs> and beyond. But when she, she told this story, and it's the story that stayed with me as well, she said that her marriage ended. She, she and her husband had to split up, and she had to leave the community. And um, so she piled her kids, her own children, on the plane and got everything organized, and they sat down. And as she looked out the window, as the plane was taking off the tarmac, the entire community was running down the tarmac, begging her not to go. And I say to my student teachers, you got to get that good. <laughs> you got to get that good that your parents, that they're your community, that your kids will never, ever want you to go. But I have to. <laughs> I have to go, because I have 30 students waiting for me at York University. I um, thank you for, for listening to me. I'm sorry I have to rush away. I hope you have a fantastic day. Thanks again. <laughs>